Buonasera, benvenuti a tutti. Benvenuti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the new panel at the Festival of Economics in Trento concerning uh, environment and growth. My name is Eugenio Corsi. I am an uh, economic journalist at Repu uh, Repubblica. We are speaking about electric cars and the restructuring in the automotive industry globally. Uh, during its uh, course, uh, um, pandemic has happened, uh, drastically reducing uh, the sales of many goods, in particular of cars. Uh, but there is a, a sector which is growing, uh, which has been indeed favored by uh, the situation, i.e. the electric cars. Uh, those of you who care for the environment, would, I'm sure, will very much like uh, this piece of news. Uh, the uh, CO2 emissions are uh, very harmful. Uh, so uh, all uh, emissions, if limited, well, uh, well that's a, a good piece of news. I um, have, um, there is a market low. So if uh, demand goes up, uh, production continues, and the prices go down. Uh, recent statistics of the New York uh, Times saying that 80.3 by Volkswagen has uh, the same price of a Golf. A Tesla 3 is like a BMW, W uh, Series 3, and uh, taking uh, 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 that car uh, in leasing is like going out for dinner in Paris or Rome. But uh, indeed, uh, that is still possible uh, thanks to the incentives and the sub subsidies given to uh, electric cars, up to 10,000 US dollars per car. Still, we have a gap to uh, fill. However, um, production is going up, prices are going down and the uh, incentives are going to come to an end. So the advantage of buying an electric car uh, will be a fact. That is indeed a real revolution in one of the most important uh, industries uh, of the planet. And uh, that is indeed a, a remarkable uh, change. Uh, everything is connected with the batteries, which guarantee the autonomy of the cars. Unfortunately, that is a, a weak uh, point. Batteries are becoming more and more effective and powerful. If, uh, well, I want to quote The Economist, um, an article published a few days ago, the total capacity of the new batteries will move from uh, 88 gigawatt per hour of 2019, and that is uh, power which is uh, enough to electrify uh, Texas for two hours up to uh, 1,400 gigawatts uh, by the year 2025, which will still uh, uh, potentiate the electric uh, uh, car industry. The chargers, uh, the charging state points, uh, there are about uh, 200,000, but this is a very limited number and uh, even less in the US. But the industry is growing so much so that uh, electric cars with batteries are 2% of the cars uh, sold in Europe, uh, uh, more or less the same in the US maybe a bit more uh, in uh, the US. So they are emerging, emerging powerfully. For that reason, we have decided to convene a, a small panel, which is managed by the uh, INET Institute, which is the Institute for New Economic uh, Thinking, which is an American think tank created after the financial crisis, more or less 10 years ago, uh, which um, is interested in uh, new approaches and new thoughts. Uh, and uh, They are indeed less rigid. Uh, um, it, it is not very much bound to old ideas of the neoliberal um, thinking. Um, they are very brilliant people. 
coordinate the research activity there is Thomas Ferguson, who is among us. He is an American, a uh, very prestigious uh, uh, economist. He had a PhD in Princeton. Uh, he was a professor at the MIT, at the University of Texas in Austin, and then at the University of Massachusetts, where he is a professor emeritus. And he is the head of the research sector of this uh, think tank. Uh, Professor Ferguson, uh, uh, who are you? Can you raise your hand? Can you show your hands? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening or good afternoon. Then we have. <laughs> right. Neil, um, and for doing the introductions here, but also Tito Boeri and his team for staging this, okay. but also the people and the authorities in. Trento, who, after all, have done this in the face of what has to be one of the most difficult environments since, I guess, the 17th century um, <laughs> in Italy, uh, when you got, again, plagues. I mean, it's been uh, doing a car panel um, is coming. I, I think the timing is perfect, I'm sorry to say, in that uh, we have large-scale wildfires in Brazil and in the United States. The United States ones, I'm pretty sure if you inhale in Trento, you can get a few particles uh, right now. Uh, I've been reading the European press on the dissemination of those fires. I mean, in, I, I live in the northeastern Massachusetts and um, our sunsets and everything are greatly affected by what's happened in California. Everything gets a lot of dust. Anyway, in this sort of apocalyptic environment, um, so we do the world car industry and its crisis. Now, let me just, I want to say just a couple of words about how a little more approximate to motivate this. Back in 2019, the General Motors Corporation in the United States had a strike. I asked around and got told, what, when I asked, what's this strike about? I was told, well, they're trying to clear the decks to make it easier to close plants and rehire people at lower wages. Um, then I was reading a German newspaper, and I saw a guy from one of the employer groups uh, actually say something that really struck me when he said, well, you know, the social partnership stuff, we may just not be able to keep this up much longer. And then I watched while the head of Zubest Metal, uh, I think it was, one of them said, you know, we need a 35-hour uh, we, we need to uh, lengthen the working day, uh, he meant, with no pay increases. Um, so we're looking here at a truly world-shaping event. I mean, this is bigger even than the steel industry uh, or even textiles in the sense that so many countries have so much employment and so much at stake. And this is quite worth discussing, and it hasn't gotten quite the attention it deserves. I do not doubt that has something to do with the timing of elections in many countries. Uh, but here we are. So uh, I'm therefore very happy that we could get a really good panel. Um, and our first speaker is Anna Maria Simonazzi at Rome Matre. I'm just going to turn it over to her. Anna Maria? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I will uh, have a PowerPoint presentation. Can you see the... Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can enlarge a bit. Okay. So, my uh, presentation is based on a paper which is uh, a joint uh, work with Jorge Careto Sanguines and Margherita Russo. Uh, I will put the electric uh, car revolution in a broader context to understand what is the future of the sector in the face of a wave of uh, innovations. So in this presentation, I will deal with the following issues. The regional structure of production and trade, the challenges that the industry is facing, of which ele the electric revolution is one, 
and the implications for the International Division of Labor and for jobs. And finally, a few notes on policies. So, the, in the last decade, we observed a huge change in the geographic organization of the industry, which has gone from concentration in core areas to global sourcing. The geographic structure of the automotive industry is now based on the presence of large assemblers and leading global suppliers in all major markets, which are organized on in functionally integrated macro-regional production networks. The competitive process results in production moving between core semi-periphery and integrated periphery. In a recent paper, we studied the changes in clustering of countries in the automotive components trade over the period 1993-2017. And you can see here on the left, the 1993, and on the right, the 2017. I cannot go into detail, but what we found was this. The production and trade is now organized more and more in macro regions. Much, trade, much of the trade occurs within the macro regions. This somehow redefines the global in global value chains. Global value chains had already been shortened by OEMs localization and follow sourcing. And uh, what we see here, perhaps it's too, too, too little, but you can believe me, trust me, we see the emergence of new peripheries which are tightly integrated with their core. Let's look at two of these integrated semi-peripheries. Mexico on the North American hemisphere and the Central and Eastern European countries on the European side. These share common features, cheap labor, geographic proximity to large markets, membership in regional trade agreements, and public incentives to foreign investment. So the creation of clusters that bring together a multiplicity of suppliers and auxiliary services around the main OEMs, the exceptional growth in production and exports, the direct and indirect creation of jobs in these semi-peripheries have been cited as indication of the activation of positive linkages. However, foreign firms, both OEMs and Tiers 1, still dominate production. They are based on state-of-the-art factories and technologies, and the research and development still occurs mostly in corporate headquarters. So, the literature is divided on the nature of this development between the thesis of a dualistic production structure, which was already uh, evidenced by Singer in 1950, which says that there will be little spillover effects on the domestic industry. And on the other hand, we have the thesis of this development as a stepping stone for catching up. These two theses are still open to questions, but there is a propensity in the literature to favor the dualistic thesis. The delocalization of process that brought to in existence these semi-peripheries, integrated semi-periphery, puts pressure on production, jobs, and wages in the core. But here we have different effects on core countries. For instance, there is Germany, which uh, succeeded in defending production and jobs, contrary to France and Italy, which have lost lots of jobs and production. And you can see here uh, the integrated periphery, which is the Eastern countries, and the falling down of the line, which is the rest of Europe. So what uh, can explain the difference between Germany and on the one hand and France and Italy on the other? Well a more extensive offshoring of car assembly by French and Italian automakers due in turn to a greater share of smaller cars in their product portfolio on the one hand, but also Germany's large exports of mostly premium cars to China. At the same time, 
German automakers offshored a greater proportion of the production of components, especially to Eastern Europe, in order to benefit from its lower labor costs, attaining a more efficient intracorporate division of labor. But as in other core countries, also German locations were under great competitive pressure. There has been shifts in jobs to low wage countries, which resulted in concession bargaining at many automotive supplier locations in Germany, as in France, as in Italy, to prevent relocations or to gain new products for the plants. Now, the, if this is the current organization of the industry, of the automotive industry, global automotive industries, now this structure is facing new social, environmental, technological, and geopolitical challenges that open new scenarios. First, digitalization, which changes the organization of production and puts jobs at risk of automation, the skilling, and work intensification. There is the connectivity, autonomy, sharing, electrification, innovations that radically change the nature of the product and the way of using it. There are changes in the balance of power between the main countries in the international arena, which influence trade agreements, redefining the convenience of location, localization. These challenges interact with one another, reinforcing or counterbalancing their effects. So what are the implications for the structure of the automotive industries and on its geographical organization? I will deal with this question on two sides. First, I would like to, to look at digit digitalization and trade agreement in the case of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Here we have a new trade agreement, the USMCA, which includes requirements on regional content, wages, and labor rights. And we have the digitalization wave. In highly fragmented global value chains, the capacity to track the product, that is to verify the history, location, status, along and across all the stages or the value chain by means of documented identification is a critical issue. And here, digitalization can be both a challenge and an opportunity because making traceability effective by the adoption of digital technologies could start a big transformation across the entire supply chain. It may represent an efficient support to tiers one and tiers two, in achieving quality control of products and ensuring the flexibility in the just-in-time programming of the flow of production. But it is also important, essential, in certifying their compliance with the treaty's requirements. So the question here for Mexico is whether tier one and tier, tier two and tier three will be able to plan now the transformation of their organization to keep up with digital transformation. Companies unable to keep the pace of traceability risk losing their customers. This is a serious challenge for the Mexican automotive industry. Now, what uh, for the challenges that are drastically changing what a car is? There is competition, which is no longer between the traditional players, but extends beyond the automotive sector to include batteries, software, connection, mobility. Core competencies are changing rapidly and require skills that have not so far been among the core competencies of automotive engineering. And uh, moreover, the shift to electric vehicles will result in a drastic reduction of components new inputs, new value chains with, with jobs lost and gained, and the new configuration of the comparative advantage of countries. So the automotive industry confronts deep uncertainty about the future evolution. OEMs and their suppliers 
need to consider multiple hypotheses in formulating their strategies. Their competencies are no longer sufficient to master the digital innovation. Alliances and flexible forms of collaboration with all competitors and new players in the technology industry alike offer a safer route as a way to share the risk, to gain speed, to gain technological advantage, to share risk as a player in the industry was saying. The increasing relevance of big data and digital devices may shift the power from the OEMs and their suppliers to high tech and IT players and platforms. If the car follows the destiny of the computer, where the value is increasingly in the software, a redistribution of profits across sectors is very likely. And this is one of the most important transformation of the industry. The second transformation concerns the fact that since research and development in the software and digital technologies are mostly developed in regions other than those dominated by OEMs, even the automotive industry's old core, which based its supremacy in engineering excellence, risks losing ground. So the core also is shifting. If this is the scenario, what is the role of public policy? And this is my last uh, slide. Well, competition between technologies that are still in uh, an early phase makes for an uncertain scenario, leaving room for the role of the state in orienting and governing the change. Public policy will be needed also because the shift to electric batteries will impact on suppliers with different intensity and may result in a drastic reduction in jobs. Semi-peripheries and integrated peripheries in Europe that specialize in the production of parts and components may suffer more. The two main European countries, Germany and France, are investing heavily in the industry to tackle the new challenges. Given the number of people directly and indirectly employed by the automotive industries in Europe, also in semi-periphery, semi-peripheral countries like Italy, like Spain, like uh, the UK. Well, a coordinated policy at the European level is urgently needed to reduce the risk of, for employment and ensure a common benefit from innovation. Thanks you. Thank you for your attention. I'm finished. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Now the next paper uh, is from Nadia Garbellini and Matteo Gatti. So one of you is going to start. Just yeah, I'm going to start. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to this panel. And thanks also to Anna Maria, who actually introduced many of the challenges which are uh, which we are going to face in the future due to the transformations in the automobile industry. Um, I would like to stress again that the key point is that global value chains. Uh, mean basically mean international division of labor. This in turn implies flows of commodities crossing many national borders and uh, employment being created in many countries. This uh, has an obvious implication, that is to say that any geographical recomposition of these chains uh, generates redistribution of employment between all the areas involved. And this has been already happening in recent years. For example, if we take the automotive, German automotive uh, global value chain. As an example, we can see that up to at least 20 years ago, uh, Eastern European countries were used to uh, provide German car makers with uh, uh, labor intensive components. Um, also, of course, due to the uh, fact that labor is cheap in those countries, cheaper with respect to Germany in those countries. Over time, these countries actually have specialized, and Anna Maria already uh, said something about this, uh, the role of Eastern EU countries in German global value chains. So over time, these countries specialized in the production of uh, less labor intensive components, uh, modules for automotive industry, which are relatively, which have a relatively high uh, technological content. And uh, uh, at the same time, these countries despecialized in basic industries. So by basic industry, we mean basically metals, chemicals, plastic, rubber, textiles, and so on. And 
while changing their role, these countries turned to their own periphery, for example, Turkey, um, to get those labor-intensive components they were used to produce by themselves. In its turn, Turkey is resorting to its own periphery, for example, India, to get all those less technological um, inputs like textiles, rubber, plastics, and so on. So basically, we have a network which is organized in concentric circles with their center in Germany. And uh, what, what, is the, what is important to stress here is that um, the new business models which are uh, spreading not only in the automobile industry, but in general, and especially in this industry, which are just in time and just in sequence models, uh, require geographical proximity in order to work. So this uh, is very important to keep these chains uh, uh, viable somehow. And we could see during the pandemic that actually these chains are very fragile, are subject to exogenous events which can break them very easily. Now, the point again is that only in the EU there are 2.5 million people which are directly employed in the automobile industry. And to these 2.5 million people, we must have all those people who are actually working in the supply chain. So we are talking about millions of jobs which are at stake now. And the problem brought about by electrification is that it is an entirely different commodity than a traditional car. As Anna Maria already stressed, the components which are needed to produce an electric car are totally different from the components which are needed to produce a traditional car. Uh, on the contrary, for example, hybrid vehicles combine both components entering an electric car and components entering uh, a traditional car. We will go back to this in a, later. Um, now, focusing our attention on the EU specifically, we have, in order to, have, to grasp the dimension of the problem, we have to, look, to start looking at two things. On the one side, the investment strategy, investment plans of big uh, OEMs, so car makers and battery producers, and on the other hand, we have to look at the policies that uh, the EU is actually mm, adopting. And so starting from the first point, currently batteries are produced mainly in Asia. Some producers actually gave some announcements about um, the opening of production plants in Europe, especially in Germany, Hungary, Poland and France. And for example, no investment plan at all is, mm, investment at all is planned in Italy and Spain, for example. So this is going to um, create uh, probably much unemployment in these two countries with respect to, for example, Eastern Europe. And <clears throat> so these uh, for batteries. Uh, as far as the production of, the production of, vehicle, of vehicles is concerned, uh, business plans of main uh, car producers show that about 45% of electric cars will take place in China. So 55% in the rest of the world altogether. Now, what is the European Union doing uh, in order to try to govern these, uh, um, these changes? Well, EU policy are basically um, based on public procurement, uh, regulations on vehicles emissions, uh, purchase incentives, tax benefits, provision of charging infrastructures and uh, the fact that the EU identified uh, batteries for electric vehicles as one of the strategic value chains to be supported at the European level. <coughs> Unfortunately, <clears throat> in our opinion, these policies are not enough. I mean, they're, they're not able to actually face the challenges we are talking about. First of all, public procurement. Let's keep in mind that we should not only focus on environmental issues, but also and mainly to occupational issues. So the point is public procurement does not guarantee that vehicles are going to be produced in Europe and therefore does not mm, guarantee that employment is preserved or increased in Europe. Of course, we know that giving priority to national companies is forbidden because it's considered state aid. So there is only one way to avoid this problem and be able to plan where to uh, create jobs. And it is resorting to in-house production, which means a public company that takes care of um, industrial policies and investments. And uh, of course, the ideal um, uh, 
uh, dimension of this public company would be the European one, because of course we are competing with macro regions, which are continents, not nation states. And so this, of course, is a content political contention, which is very relevant in our opinion. Then there is the problem of uh, the price of electric cars. I mean, the uh, intro introductory speech stressed that actually electric cars, uh, the cost of the price of electric cars uh, is going to um, uh, decrease in future, in future years. I'm not I don't know whether this will happen or not. The point is that right now, the price of these cars is very, very high. So they are not very spread among consumers because, of course, the price is not <laughs> to be something to be um, that, the, that the, a family can afford. Okay. So uh, also, uh, in this case, uh, a policy based on incentives without active participation is not, in our opinion, uh, enough. Then <coughs> charging, station, charging stations, uh, as we were already told, uh, infrastructures are still highly insufficient. Moreover, they also create another problem, which is that of the production and the distribution of electricity. Because right now, we don't have a production which is enough also to cover charging of all. I mean, if all cars were to turn electric, we would have a serious problem in uh, if we don't increase energy production and um, manage peaks and things like that. Again, this is something which, which goes beyond the single automobile industry and we think that um, a public company could be a good way to face this, this challenge. Uh, another question we have to ask is whether um, focusing on electric cars is really the answer. Uh, for example, hybrid cars have excellent environmental perfor performances, uh, comparable to that of electric cars, and they also reduce charging problems. So probably trying to um, invest more in the production of hybrid cars could help in facing the environmental problem without generating a trade-off between environmental and uh, occupational uh, objectives, policy objectives. Another point is that less polluting cars alone are not able to reduce, uh, to solve the environmental problem. First of all, we would need sustainable mobility plans because we, we need to relieve congestion in cities and to reduce traffic. Otherwise, the simple um, fact of having electric cars wouldn't be enough. And again, public transport would probably be uh, an answer or part of the answer to this problem. Um, of course, these uh, challenges are often at odds with the, the goal of the main OEMs, which is basically that of uh, generating profit. And so all the public can face these challenges without uh, having necessarily the aim of generating uh, profits. Finally, um, we have also to take into account that about 20% of total emissions generated by automobile industry is generated by the transport of these intermediate components from one country to another. And so it seems contradictory to focus only on uh, the diffusion of electric cars without trying to think also to some kind of dismantling of this model of product productive specialization, which could be again solved by some kind of public European level would be better, but uh, some kind of public intervention aiming at uh, having some kind of despecialization. So a homogeneous distribution of plants in Europe, which could also preserve employment in all European countries. So this is probably the answer to nationalistic uh, uh, ideas spreading, of, uh, spreading over Europe. So now to conclude, and then I will leave, uh, leave the floor to Matteo. Now, after the pandemic, we are discussing of the so-called recovery fund and European countries are uh, preparing investment plans in order to be able to get advantage of European money, European resources. And so the question is whether or not EU countries are taking advantage of this momentum to try to strengthen their automotive industries and the consequences of this possible restructuring. So, Matteo. 
Good evening, I share my charts. Okay. Uh, okay, Nadia and I, we analyzed the main policy adopted by some European governments about automotive sector, and that is uh, the government plan defined by Germany, Spain, and France. Not Italy, because uh, in Italy, a government plan doesn't exist. Uh, so we tried to define a kind of uh, taxonomy of this government plan. And uh, as a general remark, we can say that uh, uh, this, general, this government plan provided uh, uh, two main pillars of measures. The uh, measures demand-oriented, uh, that is incentive uh, to buy new car, to renew care fleet, etc., and measure to support uh, industrial structure, in particular from the point of view of the complete industrial network of supplier of parts, uh, components, and obviously final assembly of car. The first plan is the German government plan. The Germany is the first producer in Europe of uh, cars with uh, 4.6 million vehicles. And uh, at the same time, a uh, regional state, uh, better, a lander, the low Saxony, is one of the main shareholders of Volkswagen Group with uh, uh, about 12% of the share. Uh, <clears throat> We can see that uh, the measure, uh, the, the German government plan, involve uh, both measure of incentives uh, to acquire, to buy new car, to renew private and public car fleet, etc., and at the same time, public incentives that is public fund to support industrial production of car parts and components, and infrastructure. In particular, the focus of German government plan is the network of supplier of parts and components to help this sector uh, to address uh, the, the great ecological and technological transformation pushed by the shift toward electric of new vehicle car. And uh, further, we have also uh, general measure uh, of the of the horizontal kind, uh, such as uh, support to new energy policy, hydrogenous research and mobility in general, like new train, new railways, new shipbuilding sector, etc. The second plan analyzed is the. I'm sorry, but. The scroll, okay, perfect, is the Spanish government plan. Spain is the second producer in Europe with 2.2 million vehicles. In Spain, there are no uh, local car maker, but there are multinational group like PSA, Renault Nissan, Volkswagen, Ford, Opel, etc. Also in this case, we can see uh, measure subsidies incentive to, to the renewal of the vehicle fleet and to realize recharging infrastructure for new forms of mobility, but at the same time, a strong commitment to support in industrial investment for the competitiveness and sustainability of the sector. In particular, Spanish government will use credit tool, fiscal tool, and legal tool, and in particular about the fiscal tool to support industrial investment, uh, Spanish government uh, would reach uh, industrial and social goals. For example, to maintain employment level, to attract new share of uh, electric vehicle production and uh, to involve uh, local companies, uh, better, the companies located in Spain in the so-called life cycle battery and infrastructure of recharge for electric vehicle. 
the uh, Spanish government plan involve also an addendum that is the, the so-called uh, sector commitment. I mean the commitment adopted by private firm. And in particular, from the point of view of the number, we can see that companies, locate, car makers located in Spain adopted the commitment to produce 700,000 of new electric vehicle, both BEV, battery electric vehicle, and FEV, plug-in electric vehicle by 2030, and to realize 400,000 of new point of uh, energy recharge. Finally, the French government plan is, uh, from my point of view, the more important, because in this case, we can see the involvement, the involvement of public sector to support the technological and the ecological transformation of uh, automotive sector. Also in this case, we have both the kind of measures, incentive to acquire new vehicle, but at the same time, a strong involvement of the French state, which create public fund to support the industrial transformation and the entire network supplier. In particular, with the use of BPI, Banque Publique des Investments, French state created a fund to support the so-called automob automobile of the future. This is a fund participated both by local car maker, PSA and Renault, and at the same time, but the Bank Public uh, Desinvestment. The French state created also a fund to support the industrial development, in particular from the point of view of the supplier of parts and components made in France, and also supported the new joint venture created by PSA and Total to create the, the before mentioned plants by Nadia, uh, that is the new grid plant of battery production in France. So the Italy will be one of the two main Western European countries without a grid battery plants in the Western, in Europe, in all Europe. And also in this case, the French government plan involved a paper with the commitment of the sector. And in particular, I would stress that a goal defined by French government is the strengthening of the supplier and car makers located in France. Uh, I mean that uh, the French government want uh, to strengthen the linkage between uh, final car makers and the network of parts and supplier located in France. And in this framework, we can see the merger between <laughs> the so-called Italian, because the head of this company shifted from Italy to USA, but we can, we can say it about the Italian FCA and the French PSA. Uh, FC, FCA begins this merger with at least four disadvantages. The first one, the before mentioned goals of the French government to link strongly uh, final car maker in France and the supplier located in France. Uh, and this can cut every linkage without any other supplier located abroad, for example, in Italy. The second one, the presence of the French state in the PSA with Bank Public Desinvestment, which is one of the main shareholder of the PSA with 12% of the share, the same share of the Chinese Dong Feng. Third, the sales level in the first semester of this year, PSA in Europe sold 
three times vehicle than FCA, and finally, PSA maintained the ownership, the control of the supplying company for Asia. Uh, on the contrary, FCA sold their supplying company labeled Magneti Marelli to a Japanese company labeled Calsonic Kansai. And in this framework, PSA announced, uh, announced, imposed the use of the CMP common modular platform to realize the new vehicle of the B segment. The platform is the core uh, of the car because is the architecture involving car floor, suspension, exhaust system, brake system, etc. the space for the engine, the space for electronic components, etc. And uh, obviously, this uh, imposition, the platform uh, by PSA, obviously will involve uh, the production of the new uh, five models, Junior Jeep, Alfa Romeo Kid, 500, the new Lancia Y, CC4, that is the former Panda, with strong consequences for Italian supplier. I mean that, that Italian supplier without links with PSA can be displaced from, uh, by this decision adopted and imposed by PSA and accepted without any claim by PSA and without any claim by Italian government. So uh, already, already the main components of electric car in the case of FCA are supplied from companies located abroad. For example, the battery for electric vehicle are supplied by Samsung with a plant located in Hungary. Uh, the battery for uh, the, um, the hybrid model of the Jeep, Renegade and Compass, uh, will be supplied by the Korean LG Chem, and maybe from the Chinese company, CATL. And uh, the combustion internal engine for ma mild hybrid model uh, is uh, realized in Pernambuco in Brazil. So uh, I, I conclude uh, because I'm very concerned for employment level in Italy. In Italy, without public intervention inside the, the, the capital of FCA and without a public government plan, I'm afraid that uh, the employment level, in particular from the point of view of the blue collar, will be strongly affected. And I, I'm afraid that the consequences, the social consequences for workers will be very, very dangerous and disastrous. Many thanks for the attention. Thank you very much. Um, now we shift gears a bit in an automotive thing. I think that metaphor is perhaps perfect. Um, there is a question about what you get at the end of all this if you move to electric cars and how much you'd actually save in pollution. Now, Ryan Rafty at Oxford has been working on this, and so we'll just turn it over to him for his paper now. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, like Tom said, the, the rest of the speakers uh, earlier did a great job uh, looking at the kind of uh, overlapping crises uh, facing the automotive industry, kind of from an internal uh, lens, but also a lot of the external forces that are, they're not in complete control over. Um, and I want to look at another one of those, um, which is perhaps a largely unforeseen uh, possibility in the automotive industry, which is namely the possibility that we might see some unexpected reductions uh, in energy demand in the sector in some places uh, uh, at the level of end users. Um, we already see signs of that possibility with the switch to kind of Uber, Uber fleet uh, uh, business model. Um, some anecdotal evidence 
as well from the decline of uh, the rate of young people getting driver's licenses in some places. But that's um, uh, in that context, I'd like to look at um, uh, one thing in particular, which is the possibility of the increase in telework, which we've seen a lot of uh, during this COVID period. So I'm just gonna pull up a slide here, if you don't mind. Sorry, okay, that should be full screen now. So um, I'm gonna look at this effect on emissions specifically. Um, so COVID actually, you know, it marked a, uh, a, a, a quite a step shift in the industry, not seen perhaps since the last financial crisis. In many ways though, it was a continuation of what we've already seen with respect to environmental policies. Um, which is uh, at times of crisis, the industry um, looks to um, not only in some cases get bailed out, but you see in the case of the European Car Makers Association and other supply chain groups, um, the demand uh, that they delay implementation of vehicle CO2 regulations. And this is a common theme in many places, um, but it's part of a longer term trend, the cost component of a lot of these regulations is not trivial. And a lot of these companies are under pressure now to develop alternative powertrain technologies. In addition to the, the other um, uh, supply chain demands on, on uh, moving to a largely software-based uh, uh, autom automotive industry, you see these um, powertrain technologies that they don't really know which exactly will prevail in the end. and. Um, the industry really needs to buy time uh, if, it's if any of these countries are going to reach its, uh, their, their CO2 emissions reductions targets. Um, and that's the case just about everywhere. Uh, transport CO2 emissions continue to rise globally um, despite the manifold targets everywhere. Uh, transport CO2 emissions on, on road transport comprise about a quarter of Global final, uh, uh, global final energy demand. And that percentage is expected to grow in the years ahead as, uh, for example, electricity and heat get decarbonized uh, relatively easily to decarbonize electricity. But with respect to road transport, um, a lot of the main policy mechanisms have not uh, performed up to, up to speed. So fuel prices and CO2 taxes, I, I show with colleagues in a recent paper that the uh, price elasticity of um, emissions and uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled in the sector is a lot lower, um, a lot less than, than expected, um, at least based uh, compared to previous studies. And this is easily explained by the fact that uh, uh, path dependence in the, in the, infra in the transport infrastructure stock, uh, you get carbon lock-in when you um, have cities without mass dense public transit systems. And if you impose a carbon price in those places, you know, the people are, are constrained with respect to uh, easy shifts in the mode of transportation. So the price mechanism doesn't, the price signal doesn't work as, as intended. And the emissions reductions from that have been far lower than expected um, by um, neoclassical economic theory. Um, so we need to take a more evolutionary perspective. With respect to vehicle efficiency standards, um, incremental improvements in the efficiency with respect to power to mass ratio have been greatly uh, offset by the growth in engine power. Um, think of the fact that um, you have a relatively lower grade Nissan these days that can go up to, I don't know, 200 uh, miles per hour. Why it needs to go that fast, I don't know. But the the um, that we we haven't really looked at uh, the some of the irrationality with respect to the power, uh, the power and the engines, with respect to electricity. Um, like it was men mentioned earlier in the panel, even if we had a 100% electric vehicle fleet tomorrow, you still need to triple, roughly triple, uh, 
uh, some by some estimates double, but I think it's closer to triple if we have renewable energy, electricity. And, and so we need to triple that generation capacity within a few decades. And that's not trivial. Um, and of course, you know, with the switch to autonomous vehicles, uh, they're heavily dependent on machine learning. The computational demands of that are are extreme, um, and that's a continuous thing. It doesn't it doesn't go away over time. It's a constant um, le learning and inference uh, 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 activities that are going on at data centers, and that's going to contribute to higher electricity demand uh, indirectly. So. Let's think about these, you know, let's simplify this, look at the climate models and what they say about emissions pathways consistent with 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Um, so nothing like this has occurred before. And it's really, uh, it's a sobering graph for me, someone who works in the climate policy field, it's my focus. I mean, how are we going to get that to that, that curve to bend? And this is total global CO2 emissions. I'm not looking at transport in particular. If you were to look at the transport sector, road transport alone, um, there's actually not much optimism about the idea of you know, bending the curve towards zero. There's going to be positive emissions in transport, it's assumed, um, up through you know, mid-century. Um, this graph, um, basically requires the zero is actually um, the any positive emissions will be counterbalanced by negative emissions technologies. And those technologies, a lot of them are not yet proven at scale. So I'm sort of interested in what are the other options because there's not much discussion of things that might actually reduce emissions, you know, greater than three or 4% which is the kind of effect we've seen from taxes. So with COVID, we see something pretty extraordinary, which is about a 33% reduction globally in road transport CO2 emissions, more than any other sector. And um, in this presentation, the rest of it, I'd like to talk about some of the findings from my working paper in which I take daily data on um, daily uh, road transport CO2 emissions, uh, newly available from Carbon Monitor. I take the um, government response tracker at Oxford for the COVID containment policies, the diversity of policies that have been implemented cross-nationally during this period, and um, some uh, human mobility data from Google. And I wanted to ask, you know, what, which policies actually contributed most to this reduction in road transport CO2 emissions? And uh, of course, I can't go through the details of the econometric specifications here, but we cross-checked them across three different estimation strategies, and we got pretty much the same result every time, which is that workplace closures contributed to the vast majority of the reductions. And importantly, uh, about 8 to 40 percent, depending on the country, 8 to 40 percent of vehicle emission reductions were due to or could be attributed to teleworking in occupations where there is the capability to work from home. And that varies by countries due to the uh, availability of uh, transit systems and the uh, variability in occupational structures. But, you know, with the financial services sector and basically any uh, industry that works, you know, where the occupations um, are, you know, working from computers, there's a lot of capability to work from home. And, and so it's not all attributable to uh, economic calamity. Um, and this is uh, just a few graphs showing over time. These are daily emissions data for two, uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, this is a change relative to the same day in 2019. I shaded these areas in gray to show, um, you know, darker gray areas show when they had the um, greatest stringency of workplace closures. The light gray shows a kind of relaxation where it's a kind of partial work closure. But you see where you really get the step shifts in the road transport emissions is where we had, um, you know, pretty widespread workplace closures. Of course, not all of those companies were out of business and, and bankrupt. Uh, many of them you know, uh, did uh, make the most of the circumstances and um, workers had to adjust and businesses had to adjust from them working from home. Um, now, I, I 
put this quote from Robert Pollan here to show what the kind of mainstream view is right now in a lot of the Green New Deal discussions. Um, there's the assumption that there's not really much to learn here. Uh, the, the emissions decline because of economic calamity and unemployment, and it's a disaster. And you know, kind of, who would wish that upon anyone in the future? Certainly, certainly, there must not be something to to draw from. And this is sort of what my paper is trying to challenge um, to get us to think um, wider about the energy demands, uh, demand reductions that we might still achieve if we extend teleworking beyond the COVID period. So I mentioned earlier that the climate energy models really don't account for the possibility very well, um, except this article by Grubler, the low energy demand scenario, where you do see about a 40% uh, demand reduction in, 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 in road transport. So you know, not so far off from what we've already seen from, from the teleworking. And um, globally, one sixth of workers, a recent study showed, could perform their their uh, job remotely, and uh, greater than one fourth in developed economies. In the US, um, using more micro level data, um, which I think is, is, it was very well done. I, I, I think this study is may, maybe more accurate. It's closer to 44% of all jobs that can be performed from home, but less than a quarter ever choose to do so, or perhaps their employers don't let them. Um, so, Beyond emissions, you know, even, even if we didn't care about CO2 emissions, and you know, there's lots of other benefits, reduced congestion um, and the, you know, road fatalities, um, nitric oxide emission uh, pollutants uh, around the world are giving a lot of cities, um, China and India especially, a headache with uh, air pollution uh, and health co healthcare costs. Um, of course, um, there's also a good behavioral economics literature out there showing that longer commuting times are associated with uh, lower satisfaction uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, car dependency especially, if you depend on private cars, they, there's a systematic uh, reduction in um, subjective reporting of well-being. Um, and a, a classic uh, study from uh, Putnam showed a 10 minute longer commutes associated with 10% lower social capital. People get to spend less time with, with uh, family and loved ones if they're spending so much of their day uh, on, on the road. Uh, and um, of course, you know, this would take a lot of adaptation from businesses if uh, teleworking were to expand beyond the COVID period. Uh, we'd see a re geographical redistribution of commercial activity like we've already seen in many places from the inner city to the outskirts where people are spending more of their money during this period. It's revitalizing um, a lot of local store owners in some places. So it's not entirely such a bad thing. It's just that businesses will need to adapt and rethink office space planning, especially where we might have rotational schemes where workers only come in some of the time. So in some important caveats, um, you know, not everyone will like this. Uh, not everyone wants it. Some people like their colleagues and want to want to be at work sometimes, and you can't blame them. So this could be easily solved with you know, going into the office a couple of days a week. But the key is the uh, flexible workplace culture um, that, that could be driving some of this, and that I think many more people will start demanding in the months and years ahead. Uh, in the, anecdotally, in the financial services industry, apparently this is already happening. Um, there's, of course, the risk of exacerbating existing inequalities. Not all occupations can work from home. And um, the need to extend uh, greater financial support uh, to, to uh, of course, to families with children and to, to support childcare facilities, and in general, to increase enrollment in education and training at universities and uh, continuing education of all sorts would be a very wise investment, regardless of uh, whether we take this path towards emissions reductions. But um, just to conclude, of course, this is just a, um, a, a speculative activity here that I'm presenting based off of um, pretty robust empirical evidence recently. Um, that doesn't change what's happening in the automotive industry and the need to adapt and um, the challenges for employment moving ahead. Um, if anything, it might just compound them, but it's something to keep an eye out for, I'd say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan.
And thanks to all the panelists, actually. These were great papers. They were well delivered, very clear. I, I actually, most panels I'm on, I confess, I sometimes suffer through. I didn't on this one. Thank you all. Now, I'm the official respondent, um, and I will just make a few remarks because I'm certain we want to, I think we can probably deal with questions from people. Um, but uh, I think a few remarks on several topics. Um, I think maybe one on Ryan's, which I was extremely interested to see the rundown of in the Wall Street Journal the other day on asking executives, top executives, what did they really think of work from home? And I noticed that most of them were basically negative. There were a few financial firms and a few Silicon Valley firms that were a little more positive, though even some of the Silicon Valley firms, firms were saying no. Um, and this is an interesting question. It might be an avenue for public policy. Obviously, if you decide there's a massive externality in telling everybody to come into work, uh, as Ryan suggests, well, you know how to fix that just as well as I do, even if the chances of getting it done in some places are not necessarily high, you can tax it. Uh, I mean, this is a case where public policy could make an intervention. Um, but um, well, now let me go on I, more broadly about the car industry. I think I put my comments under uh, three headings. One is data, a second one uh, is infrastructure, and a third, what I'm going to call process. And I don't mean driving to work or something like that. Now, let me just talk a bit about the data story. I, I think all these, these, I've said, I think these papers are great. They're really good. Um, and I would add that, you know, of the two on the car industry were commissioned by INET. Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to, um, although there. Um, but um, I think they underplay a really important theme on data, uh, which I, I'll just sort of make the point by telling a story. Um, a friend of mine um once was talking to a, a person who just closed down their firm. They just decided to shut it. And the guy was saying to him, well, we've sold all our office furniture and we've sold our place where we had our headquarters and all this stuff. The thing I'll never sell is my data. And that, that I think that happened about 15 years ago. That was sort of the first point where I got the idea, you know, data, okay, this is maybe more interesting than I thought. And in fact, when you go to an electric car, and particularly if you try to do self-driving cars, which you know nobody actually mentioned those today, that's because when they try them in Arizona, somebody gets run over periodically uh, there. Um, and, um, but, and they're obviously not ready for prime time. But on the other hand, uh, they are being tested in cities in and out of the United States. Um, and it's they're probably going to happen. But to make this stuff work really well, you need a fantastically powerful data capacity. The so-called 5G systems uh, can perhaps make that work. The earlier ones really can't. And it's quite instructive to look at debates within countries, not just within the United States, say within Germany too. I have seen uh, research institutes in Germany saying it just wouldn't pay to do really big uh, tech system, Wi-Fi wi wi systems in, Ger in all of Germany. That's a claim. Now in the, in the US, that decision is left largely to oligopolies um, in the telecommunications industry and they have quickly decided, no, they will not be doing rapid buildups of, of uh, Wi-Fi, really good Wi-Fi connections in say Western Massachusetts, big chunks of New Hampshire and lots of other less densely settled areas. Um, you know, other countries like Korea, do run these systems uh, very heavily connected, and they'll obviously probably do better in this. But the point about the, the information levels here are enormous. 
And when you go to public transport systems, I know that in Italy, for example, Milan has been restructuring, doing up data plans. Uh, and there's a huge question about who owns the data? I mean, there's all kinds of brave talk about trying to link, say, some self-driving cars to uh, the public transport system. So you could hop, you could get out of your house, you could hop the, the self-driving car, go, I'll speak in the American style, a couple of miles, uh, and then, you know, go switch on the Milan subway two or three times and then emerge into a, perhaps another self-driving car. Whoever owns that data has a fantastic advantage over the people who don't. Now, I guess this is a case where the public character of the data is of extreme interest. And if you think this question is going to get settled out of the free market, you're simply mad. It's not any more than uh, that's sort of like asking folks who settled, to use a nice contemporary example, uh, who arrived from Europe into the North and South America and expecting that sort of free market to just settle up with the natives on how who owns what in the jungle or in the prairies. It's not something, uh, it's not an experiment I recommend running yet again. Uh, okay, the, the data question here is enormous. Um, a second one um, is uh, the infrastructure problem, because of course, just laying these data um, channels, if you like, is very, very expensive. And it's also true what all of the speakers mentioned, it's not absolutely sure which technology wins out. So you get these, uh, you can see Silicon Valley eyeing, well, Detroit uh, and Germany, and perhaps, uh, as Matteo remarked, uh, France, and others, and all saying, mm, how much of this can they swallow? Um, my sense is, again, that the public infrastructure component on this is inevitably going to be very interesting. You could perhaps get more competitive uh, lanes in some places. I know that, for instance, electric utilities in the United States have gone to various large cities and said, okay, we will guarantee you uh, places to charge your buses if you'll convert your bus fleet to all electric. Now that pulls you out of the oil complex, which you might have noticed in the United States is, you, is quite uh, powerful, um, and elsewhere too, though. Uh, but uh, again, this is when you get to large scale infrastructure, you are pretty much demands, if you're not to have absolute nonsense, some fairly serious public planning. It doesn't have to, you know, that doesn't mean you do it like it was done in the Soviet Union in the mid 30s. That's stupid. Uh, okay, that doesn't work. Uh, but you're going to have to be doing bodies that review because if you don't, the, pr the private producers are going to run as an oligopoly. You're not going to like those results, even if the oligopoly widens um, over time. Now, a few remarks on process. Uh, now, by process, I mean especially this. How does this business of channeling get in effect, to speak perfectly straightforwardly, how do you get rid of the old producers and get the new ones to... Uh, produce. Now, they may be the old producers, but there are lots of people thinking that maybe you could get new ones. Now, the reason I'm so interested in this is that this is a lot, you, when you, this is all, we've done this, we've turned this trick both in Europe, the United States, and elsewhere many times before. An exceedingly interesting thing to look at is the question of how bankruptcy legislation and labor legislation collide or they harmonize. Um, in particular, what happened in the United States in coal mining and steel, uh, where lots of firms went bankrupt, is the workforce was typically left with nothing, not pensions. Uh, you know, they, in some cases, they had to leave with unpaid wages and things like that. In the auto bankruptcy, uh, which was managed by the Obama administration, it, it wasn't wonderful, but you got a somewhat different outcome. They saved the pensions. Uh, of the workforce. Now, the question is, as the squeezes develop on auto producers, 
How much, if you like, to put it somewhat loosely, this is after all a very brief comment, um, how much bankruptcy versus how much state aid did the existing producers are you going to try to do? You can see a clear debate in Germany where a lot of ordo liberals, for example, are talking up creative destruction. And when you hear folks talking up creative destruction, your rabbit ears should go way up because it means that somebody is about to pick your pocket uh, there. Um, and it seems perfectly obvious to me that a lot of folks are hoping that lightning can strike uh, and that uh, existing firms might go out of business, forcing complete renegotiations of wage contracts. And that folks are just going to have to be alert to this because the the you get into, I mean, the legal systems are very different, say, between the U.S. and Europe, and how you trade off labor uh, rights under labor legislation against bankruptcy, uh, it's complicated. But people need to start thinking about this uh, because lots of people are. And particularly under COVID, you can see that uh, exactly as some of our speakers mentioned, you can see there's all this talk of European Union intervention. On the other hand, I think when you sit back and you study uh, what um, is actually being talked about. It's mostly at the country level, and that uh, there's not a lot of coordinated uh, European uh, level discussion here. And so um, this is an area where I think you want to pay close attention. And in particular, I will close with this observation. As you bust up firms and you see newer ones come into being, you want to watch for things like the role of finance, and in particular, private equity groups. It is perfectly obvious to me, I can see the private equity groups flying around in both the US and Europe, an unsympathetic being like myself would say, like a bunch of vultures. Uh, but uh, you can get into situations here where with incredible speed, you can get institutional changes that might take 20 years in a, in a situation where if you get into a series of weak firms, the wrong bankruptcy procedures, and then financing that is enthusiastic about blocking out uh, older forms of labor relations, you could get some really striking outcomes. Uh, you know, if you think, therefore, that a pandemic is a problem, wait till you have a pandemic and some mass bankruptcies. On that cherry note, I'll, I'll stop. And uh, we can perhaps, the panel may want to respond briefly. Everybody could have some. Uh, maybe if you have any comment or anything. And either any of you feel like commenting? I'm afraid that uh, we are a little out of time. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Because, yeah. uh, you know, we have, we have limited time and, and uh, sure. we have already exceeded it. Sorry about that. All right. Quindi, okay. Niente, scusate questa brutale interruzione, però. I'm so sorry to, that I had to stop you so abruptly, but our time is over. Um, maybe we'll be able to speak about the implication of using uh, rare earths. See you next year. Bye bye.